Hi, my name is Justin Gregg. I'm an assistant professor of urology and health disparities research at UT MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I'd like to thank uh, BJUI Compass and Dr. John Davis and the editorial board for asking me to present about evaluating biomarkers for use in cancer screening. So the goal of this talk is to give a baseline or foundational knowledge about common measures of screening biomarker performance. And a lot of the impetus for this as a urologist is based on a common example of PSA screening. Now in practice, we all know and all of the trainees who are watching this know that PSA testing on the one hand can save lives, but is also limited in terms of sensitivity and specificity, the ability to detect disease um, when we need to. Now, there are many tests that have been proposed to improve the specificity of PSA, and the idea is to reduce unnecessary biopsy. Though it's important to note that any test that typically increases specificity will often decrease the sensitivity uh, for prostate cancer. So I think we need to dive a bit into what those terms mean and how we evaluate screening biomarkers. And of course, it's important to note that specificities are dependent upon the incidence in a population. And we won't go into things like positive predictive value or negative predictive value. Um, but if you remember from medical school, um, the, those numbers will change based on how common a disease is in a population that's being tested. So before we dive into how the biomarkers are evaluated, I want to begin by doing a bit of a summary of sensitivity and specificity. What you can see on the slide here is a common plot of a test for a disease. And this is with a binary answer, such as prostate cancer, yes or no. Now on the left side here, you can see that there is an objective standard of truth. So let's say that we can know with 100% certainty whether or not someone has a disease. That's the standard of truth. Um, here you can tell these are patients who do not have disease, and they're patients who have it. Now on the top here, you can see that there is a test, and that test is looking to detect the disease, and you either have a negative test or a positive test. So among patients who objectively do not have the disease, if the test results negative, then that is desired, first of all, and that is the representation of specificity. So therefore, if a patient does not have the disease, but the test is positive, that is a type one error or a false positive. Now, on the other hand, patients who have the disease, you want the test to be positive. And if the test is positive, that is the measure of sensitivity. A sensitive test does a good job of detecting the patients who truly have the disease. Now, on the other hand, if the patient has the disease and the test is negative, that's a type two error or a false negative. So particularly in a screening study, we try to avoid uh, false negatives for something like prostate cancer. Now, what is this AUC area under the curve that we hear about in the literature and that's commonly reported when looking at biomarker tests? So I think it's important to recognize that sensitivity and specificity are the bedrock of these tests and we'll walk through an example of how it works. So what you can see here is our test results that are resulted, you know, say these are PSA results of men who were looking for prostate cancer in. Now, this red group, this red plot represents patients who do not have the disease and the blue plot represents patients who do have the disease and using PSA as our example, you can see going from left to right, or let's assume that from left to right, this is a PSA blood test that gets higher and higher. So you can see there are many patients who have a low PSA who do not have prostate cancer, and also there are many that have a high PSA that do have prostate cancer. But of course, there is some overlap. So let's walk through it a little bit. In order to determine the specificity and sensitivity of a test, you need to have a threshold. So we are saying arbitrarily that this is our threshold right here. So you do your test. If the value is less than where this line is, you call the patient negative. If it's more, you call the patient positive. Therefore, this group in blue of men who truly have prostate cancer, 
that have a positive test are the true positive. To contrast, there are men who do not have prostate cancer who tested positive. These are false positives. And again, looking to the left or lower to our threshold, this is the group of true negatives, patients who do not have the disease that had a negative test. And here you can see false negatives, those with prostate cancer who tested negative. Now, if you can imagine, looking graphically, this threshold can be moved. This is us just choosing a value that we say, okay, the test is positive or negative. What if we move the threshold to the right, where you need to have a higher test, or excuse me, a higher value to be said that the test is positive? We could move it even further to the right. Look in this case, anyone who tested positive actually had the disease. So that's 100% specificity. However, look, there is an enormous number of men who had a negative test that actually had the disease. If you can imagine a screening setting, that's probably not the best test, given that you're missing so many patients who have the disease. Now, what happens if we move the threshold even further, but this time going to the left? Now, in this case, you can see all these patients to the right of the dotted line are considered as positive tests. Now, there are a number of men who are truly negative that test positive, though the vast majority of men who have the disease are testing positive. Now, if we move the threshold even further, we're capturing almost every patient who has the disease as a positive test, meaning we are approaching 100% sensitivity. However, there are almost half of the men who do not have the disease that are testing positive. That means the specificity is about 50%. So what I'm trying to show you here is depending on what threshold you choose, the specificity can be forced to go up or forced to go down with a concomitant change in the sensitivity. 100% sensitivity will leave you with a very poor specificity. Now what an ROC curve is, is a graphical demonstration of the sensitivity and specificity across the infinite spectrum of thresholds. So what you can see is that over here, each line is a chosen threshold. And now on the ROC curve, so ROC is the name of the curve itself, you can see that for each threshold, the true positive rate or sensitivity is placed on the y-axis and the false positive rate or one minus the specificity is placed on the x-axis, thereby plotting each of these points. Now to make the curve, a regression is completed to show the curve. And then the area under the curve is simply the computed area within this plot. And what that means is that a good test has a you know, very low false positive rate and a high true positive rate so when these, plot, when these points are plotted out, there's a high amount of area under the curve, and that's measured on a value of zero to one. So that's getting closer to one. Now a poor test has poor sensitivity and sensitivity at the various thresholds. And you can see that it has graphically, or really visually, less area under the curve. And just to go to the extremes, an absolutely perfect test would discriminate perfectly between patients who did and did not have the disease. The area under the curve is 1.0, 100%. Now the worst test is the equivalent of a coin flip. It in no way discriminates between those who do and do not have the disease at every single threshold that is chosen. It's always 50% at those thresholds. So you can see that the worst test has an area under the curve of 0 0.5. So let's do a real world example of area under the curve to evaluate a biomarker. Now, most have heard of PCA3. It's a non-coding mRNA that's highly expressed in prostate cancer, has minimal normal tissue expression, is not shown to correlate with prostate size, and can be measured in the urine following a vigorous DRE. And there have been studies 
looking in the setting to diagnose prostate cancer and using these studies, thresholds were chosen. And as you can see, what you may expect in a biomarker study is as the PCA3 level increased, the percentage of men who had a positive biopsy increased as well. So based on this cutoff value of 35, you can look at the sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing prostate cancer based on the PCA3 in these data. So the sensitivity is 54%, though it's more specific at 74%. However, what if we wanted to evaluate it over the spectrum of cutoffs, not just the cutoff that was chosen of 35? So you'd do an ROC curve and calculate the area under the curve. So as you can see here, which I think is interesting, this solid black line is the area under the curve or the ROC plot for just PSA. And it's actually close to 0 0.5, it's 0 0.547. Now this gray dot shows the area under the curve for PCA3, and that performed much better in this study, 0 0.686. Now when you did a combination of PSA, PCA3, and other clinical factors, it improved even further to an AUC of 0 0.752. So this is the demonstration that PCA3 across a range of thresholds uh, is likely better at detecting prostate cancer, at least in this population, when compared to PSA. And hopefully you can now see that and see how these um, ROC curves and computation of the area under the curve can affect that. Now there are some disadvantages, as you can imagine, to using the area under the curve to evaluate a screening biomarker. There's some difficulties in clinical comprehension. You're measuring something across a range of thresholds, but in reality, we're urologists. We need to make a decision, and there needs to be a threshold for a test if you're going to use it in a population. It also does consider sensitivity and specificity as equally important when evaluating the biomarker, when in practice, we may favor one versus the other. In our screening example, it may be very important not to miss a case of prostate cancer. Therefore, sensitivity would be quite important with specificity having a lower um, importance to the clinician. Now, the confidence scale may also be unreliable. When you get to some of the um, ends of the curves or the portions of studies where there are fewer patients that meet a certain uh, you know, test positivity or a certain value of that test, there are not as many patients who are driving the sensitivity and specificities at those thresholds. Um, so that may be somewhat unreliable. And finally, the ends of the curves, like we were just mentioning, may have minimal data, but a large effect. And the last part is what we mentioned a bit is that prevalence of disease is important when you're looking at test positivity. You know, implicitly these, these curves assume a 50% prevalence, when in practice, true positives are increased if there is a higher prevalence. So in summary, sensitivity and specificity are core considerations of any screening test, and these are based at a single threshold. Now the area under the curve of an ROC curve is a very nice summary of specificity and sensitivity across a variety of thresholds. It gives you a good way to compare different markers in the screening setting. However, ultimately the threshold that's chosen and how you interpret at that threshold in a certain population that you're using the test is what determines whether or not a biomarker is used. So to conclude the talk, I'll just thank again BJUI Compass and its editors uh, for allowing me to give this presentation. Feel free to reach out with any questions at jrgreg G-R-E-G-G -G, at mdanderson.org. And also can follow me on Twitter at Justin R. Gregg, G-R-E-G-G. -G. Thank you.